There are very few people that have unrestricted access to me. Besides my wife, I can count only six. If any of you entered my house, put your feet up and said, what's for supper, you would quickly find out how much access you really had. You may have access, but that access is limited. Even our extended family, the extended family of my wife and I have provisional access. Likely you all in your marriage at one point or another experienced an unannounced visit from the in-laws, which resulted in a marital discussion afterwards. (laughs) An elected official or the CEO of a large company may see hundreds of people a day, but the personal access to speak, influence, and impinge upon such a person's schedule is relegated to two or three persons. The closest members of the cabinet, the closest advisors, and the personal secretary. The personal secretary even has the right and determines who is given access and who is flatly denied. Access applies to places, too. We're familiar with signs that limit entry because of the danger that may exist. Access is restricted on the construction site across the street or the quarry down the road. The sign at the electrical substation reads, Caution, hazard, chance of electrocution, burn, or death. Restricted access keeps people out. Access to Mount Sinai was limited. Only Moses and a few chosen leaders could go up. Only Moses could reach the top. A barrier was set around the base of the mountain not to protect God, but to protect the people. Individuals who approached and touched the mountain would be killed by the mere fact of their sinfulness being in the presence of God's very holiness. They had no access because they could not approach God in a safe way on account of their uncleanness. It was as dangerous as a furry squirrel tiptoeing onto a transformer. The amazing thing that the writer to the Hebrews declares in this section is that we, you and I, have access to God's presence. You don't have the right to come into my home, but you have unfettered and unrestricted access to God's gracious presence in heaven. Yet how is this possible, you may ask? How can this be? How is it that God's people who couldn't even touch the mountain without fear of death in the old covenant can lead to God's people in the new covenant approaching God's heavenly sanctuary without fear. The writer to the Hebrews simply answers in this way. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from a bad conscience, and having had our bodies washed with pure water. Read between the lines, you'll understand what the writer's saying. Once a year, and once a year only, the high priest, and only the high priest, would venture into that holy of holies, the top of the mountain, you might say. It was dark because of the thick curtain of separation, the smoke of the incense that was burned on the altar before that holy place. He would practice beforehand. He would walk out the steps and how many turns and when to sprinkle. He had to do it blind. And a rope was attached to his foot in case he transgressed God's holiness and was struck down. He entered the curtain. He entered through the curtain before the presence of God on earth. And he could do so only by the blood that he carried and that had been sprinkled on him in the day of his ordination, that he entered behind the veil through the sacrifices offered. 
The washing in the basin and the courtyard also had prepared him for properly entering the presence. In Holy Communion, we are sprinkled with the blood of Jesus. In baptism, we were washed with clean water, washed of all of our iniquity. We are given, as the writer said, not a tenuous access. It doesn't say be fearful, be unafraid. Boldness before God in heaven. Through the means of our baptism with the washing of this pure water into the death and resurrection of Jesus, and through his flesh and blood that we receive in Holy Communion, we have a right to walk behind the veil into the very presence of God. Our bodies and our consciences have been cleansed from sins committed by this blood that was shed on the cross and applied to us. It is not alone that Jesus died for us, not alone that was not all he did for us. It is also that he instituted this supper, that his very body and blood is applied to us with great assurance for that purpose. Christ gained access to us through his own flesh and blood. God looks at us and sees that we're covered with his son's flesh and blood. You come in through the veil by means of the flesh and blood of another. It is your key card of access into the house of heaven. His blood cleanses you for involvement in liturgical and priestly life. You have a greater access to an even better place than the high priest had in the Old Testament and because of the blood of the New Covenant. The word in this section, to go back and look at it, if you want to look at it, the full assurance of faith there, that word right there is what we're going to focus on in the last part of this sermon. Um, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. The word full assurance, that doesn't mean tenuous, it means boldness. The word that Hebrews uses to describe this axis is a word that goes back to the Greco-Roman world. It's the word in the Greek parisia, parisia, parisia. It described the right to public discourse, the right to free speech for common citizens in Greek city-states in the democratic assembly in debates preceding important decisions when the public officials would make these decisions. It described also those who sometimes, in such cultures, when facing opposition for their boldness, spoke without cringing, to an evil tyrant knowing that they had this right and it could not be taken away. It described this word, the right of a wife with her husband and the candid speech between one friend to another. Hebrews declares that you have more, however, than the right of a citizen to approach a king, but the privileged status in Jesus to approach God without restrictions, the right of a royal son. Now, for a moment, and recognizing how limited our speech has become now in this cancel culture, how in our world we have to always watch our tongues, even when we speak the truth, we have the so-called right of free speech now, yet we have to talk in hushed tones about things that are right and true and good. Think of this. Recognize what you have before God that cannot be taken away. You have the right of free speech. This is not something to throw away. It is something to hold on to like a key to a house. Through the flesh of Jesus and his blood, you have this axis and boldness of tongue before your heavenly Father. And what should we do with this right? Well, the writer to the Hebrews tells us this. Let us draw near. Let us draw near with a true heart and the full assurance of faith. Let us draw near. I have a key. I have a key to a home on high. I have a key even that I enter into this place. When heaven draws near to me in the divine service, I enter with confidence and boldness, having the flesh of Jesus and being sprinkled by his bloodshed through the washing 
of pure water in my baptism. And the Lord blesses me as I go into the heaven of heavens, the heavenlies itself. The Lord be with you, the pastor says, and with your spirit I respond. On the journey into the heavenlies together, pastor and people were joined in a common endeavor where we bless each other. We worship with saints and archangels, and we worship in heaven itself. Our prayers and our deepest sighs are heard before God in heaven. Let us draw near, and let us recognize what we have. Let us not keep away as citizens of our heavenly kingdom. Let us live our lives with boldness and confidence, and let us stir up one another and encourage one another with the knowledge of these things. Let us present our prayers with confidence. Let us understand what has been given and applied, which gives us that boldness of access. Real blood for real sins to real lives. A fleshly body for sinners who have committed sins in their flesh. Flesh for flesh, blood for blood. Let us live with the knowledge of this, with confidence and boldness and free speech before our God. And let us see this community for what it is. And finally, let us put our feet up in God's house and always say, Hello, Lord, it's me. What's for dinner? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.